Welcome to all of you who are here <clears throat> in person, the sanctuary. Thank you so much for coming. And those who are watching by way of internet, uh, via all these uh, social media sites that we're on, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, I believe, and some of the others that I've heard of, but I'm not on all of that. Uh, I'm still a dinosaur when it comes to technology, but and believe it or not, I prefer it that way with all this stuff that's going on on social media. <clears throat> but it's a good tool that God uses to get his word out, particularly during this time of uh, pandemic where uh, churches are not at full strength. Yet we do know that the Lord is still on the throne. This morning we are turning to the 14th chapter of the book of the Revelation. The 14th chapter. I'm going to read just a few passages from this chapter. I'm starting at verse 1. I'm reading from the <clears throat> New American Standard Version of the text. And I look and behold... The lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000, <clears> having his name and the name of the Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of a loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was the sound of the harpers playing on the harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not <clears throat> been defiled with women for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes and they have been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie or guile was found in their mouths, for they are blameless. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and 
tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. <clears throat> and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second one, followed right after him saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She was made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And another angel, a third one, followed him saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wrath, the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angel in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They will have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and the image who have received the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, yes, says the spirit, they may rest from their labors for their deeds will follow them. <clears throat> and I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man having a golden crown in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle, thrust in your sickle and reap, because the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle, over the earth, and the earth was reaped, and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out of the, from the altar. And he called out with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. And the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridle or the bit, the mouth, about four and a half feet deep and a distance of about 200 miles. May God have a blessing to the reading <clears throat> of his word. The book of the Revelation is a fantastic book. I've enjoyed going through it on several occasions, in seminary and also preaching through the book and teaching it at different churches in the area. It's a fascinating book because it tells the believer we have nothing to worry about. But it's a warning to the unbelievers, those who don't know Christ, those who have been putting it off because they ain't got no time for him. They don't feel like they need Christ. It's a warning to people like that. But this morning, I want to look at uh, this chapter from the thought, a preview of coming attractions. A preview of common attraction. Now, I want you to understand the time frame uh, when John is writing chapter 14 is at the middle of the week of the seventh week of Daniel. He's writing at that particular time. And uh, notice what he says here. Uh, I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. John has given us a preview of what's going to happen <clears throat> during the last half of the tribulation period, which is still yet future. Previews are designed to show us what's coming in the future. If you've ever gone to a movie theater, uh, before they show the main event, uh, the main movie, they always let, make you 
sit through 15 to 20 minutes of previews. I remember going to see Black Panther and boy, they had so many previews. Uh, if I hadn't paid my money, I would have walked out. But uh, we sitting there waiting for the movie to start, and they keep going one after the other. And some of those movies wouldn't come out till a year later. But they're designed to whet your appetite. Revelation 14 is a preview of coming events. The future is already written in advance. And this chapter is designed to show believers, and particularly unbelievers, some important things that are going to happen that's going to take place in the future. So as we look at this chapter in more detail, let us take notice of some of God's coming attraction. Let us preview, let's look at a preview of God's powerful preser preservation. John says, and I look and behold, the Lamb of God was standing on Mount Zion. Now he said, wait a minute now, how do you get <clears throat> the word preview for this chapter. Would I get it uh, from the word look? But John says, I look and behold the lamb. The word look there in Greek is called a proleptic. A proleptic is a word which takes a look at a future event as if it has already happened. So as I go through this chapter, I'm going to put all of this in a time frame for you in the future so you'll be able to walk through it, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and not uh, get confused. Now notice what he says, I looked and behold the lamb. The lamb we know is Jesus Christ. And notice he was standing <clears throat> on Mount Zion. Now here's the issue that scholars debate whether or not talking about Mount Zion in heaven, according to, uh, there is a Mount Zion in heaven, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Or is it talking about Mount Zion <clears throat> in Israel on earth? I'm of the opinion that it's talking about Mount Zion on earth. And the reason why I say that is because it says in verse 2, I heard a voice from heaven. So a voice is speaking out of heaven to those on Mount Zion on earth. Now notice here, he said, I saw, I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. And guess who was with him? The 144,000 having his name and the name of the, his father written on their foreheads. Now, this is the same 144,000 <coughs> that we saw in chapter 7, same group of men. And God has preserved them through the entire period of the tribulation period because when Christ comes out of heaven and stands on Mount Zion, they are with him which shows you that God has preserved his people. He has secured those 144,000 evangelists. But notice the contrast here. Notice here, they were standing on Mount Zion, and in chapter 13, you see Satan standing on the sand of the seashore. Now, Standing here in verse 1 means standing victoriously. They have overcome whatever the Antichrist threw at them, whatever the Antichrist tried to do to them, the Antichrist was not successful because God had promised their preservation. He said they cannot be killed. And what God said was true. The 144,000 are sitting, uh, excuse me, are standing on Mount Zion, Israel. But notice something else. And they said, John says, having his name, what name? The name of the Lamb and the name of his Father written on their forehead. 
You see, when, God's, when people accept Christ as their Savior, they're marked. All of you sitting here watching by internet or whatever form you are, if you are a believer, you're saved, you've been marked. The mark is the seal of the Holy Spirit on you, which says you belong to God. But there's another mark in the future we're going to call the mark of the beast, where unbelievers are going to take that mark. Now notice, why is John telling us this? Why is Jesus telling John this? Because it's an encouragement to John. Because John, when he writes the book of the Revelation, even though Emperor Domitian had banished him to the Isle of Patmos, he's going to be released and go back and write the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They were written after the book of the Revelation. But notice, why do they have in the name of their foreheads important? Because it says they belong to God. And whenever I buy a book, and I bought many books, I got many books now. I write my name in them. Now, why do I write my name in my books? I write my name in them because I want people to know if they ever found this book, this is the rightful owner. Donald M. Reed. That book belongs to him, not to John, but to Donald M. Reed. God has put his name on you and me to let us know that we belong to him if we accept the Christ and the Lamb who is the lamb. That's identifying mark. So notice, what is the mark? What is it that mark your life that you belong to Christ? What distinguishing feature about you and me that let the world know that we belong to Christ? You can have the mark. You can be a believer and betray that with your life. But notice, these guys had God's name on them. And notice heaven's enthusiastic celebration. Verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of a loud thunder. And the voice I heard, like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Notice, they are ecstatic. They are rejoicing. And notice, as Dr. Sam Gordon said, they are deliriously happy. They sang a new song. That is, the new song was based on their new experiences. For example, I wonder how your and my praise, how different it would be if you made an A on a test versus someone paying off your mortgage. I do believe, though you'd be happy you made an A on an exam, but you'll be deliriously happy if someone paid off your mortgage. These guys, the heaven is rejoicing because, and they are singing because of what God has done for them. I think our praise meter will go up, go through the roof. When God has done, we realize what God has really done for us. And guess what? We won't care who even hears us. Now, I've told you, I can't hold a note in my pocket. <laughs> I mean, I wish I could sing. I mean, some of these preachers, boy, I, I listen to some of them, boy, they can sing. They can, you know, they can bring the house down. My singing will burn the house down. But I sing. You know why? Because you didn't save me. God did. You're not keeping me alive. God is. 
God is the one that's feeding me. God is the one that's taking care of me. And therefore, God says, let's sing a new, fresh, invigorating song. I shudder to think that people really don't praise God like they do. And then he says, notice, they don't praise God like they should, brother. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Now, why is that? Why are they the only ones could know the song? Because no one can know the joy that salvation brings except the redeemed. The only people that really know what salvation brings are those who know Christ. And therefore, if anybody ought to be singing praises of God, ought to be those who have been redeemed. Heaven is ecstatic over what has happened. God is on his throne, ladies and gentlemen. But notice something else. The servant's steadfast dedication. Note their consecration. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they kept themselves chaste. He's not saying it's wrong to have sexual relationship. He says it's wrong to have it outside of marriage. It's wrong to be involved sexually in fornication and adultery. These men stay consecrated. In other words, their life bagged up their lips. Why? They were God's evangelists. And notice their dedication. For they kept themselves chasing. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Notice, they follow Christ. L listen, ladies and gentlemen, during the tribulation period, it's not going to be easy to follow Christ. It's not going to be easy to stand up for Christ. Listen, we're living today in 2020. I'm getting ready to go into 2021. And I've never seen as much hatred today in America for Christianity since I've been saved. There is a hatred for Christianity in America. And it's growing. And some Christians have given up the ship. They've embraced the culture. They've embraced this philosophy. They've embraced this theology. They've embraced this belief in order not to be persecuted. These men follow Jesus. Too, many, too, too often, there are too many people who don't want to be identified with Jesus. These men follow Jesus wherever he went. During a time of great stress, a time of great persecution, Antichrist is on their tra trail. Yet they follow Christ. But today, if somebody even don't speak to us on Sunday morning, we'll stop going to church. We'll stop singing. And we'll start singing the song, Woe is me. These men, they followed Christ wherever he went. They weren't ashamed to be identified. Are you ashamed to be identified with Jesus in this culture? Are you afraid to speak truth to power? Stand up for biblical truth and biblical values in this culture? But they watered down the word of God. Will you stand among the faithful? Can God count on you to stand? Can God count on me to stand in a culture that's going real fast toward the sewer? We're almost in the sewer as a culture. We ain't far from there now. They're passing laws. And every one of them just about as anti-God. And how dare you disagree with those laws? 
Companies will fire you. People don't want to be around you. The culture changed, but God's word didn't change. It hasn't changed. It won't change. And these men, they follow. Notice their dedication. Notice their salvation. They have been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now, what does it mean by the first fruits? The first fruits are the first of the fruits that get ripe to tell you that the rest of the fruits on the tree is going to be just like the first fruit. It's going to be a good harvest or a bad harvest. These 144,000 are the first ones, write this down, they're the first ones to be saved on the tribulation period. That's what we're trying to tell you. Many are going to get saved. But these are 144,000 Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, people always talk about the lost tribes of Israel. Chapter 7 will tell you, listen, God knows who they are. And in their mouths was found no guile. They were blameless. In other words, they had good character. As D.L. Moody said, nothing locks the lips like the life. But watch a preview of God's alarming exhortation. Look at it in verse verse. Six, and another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water worship him. Notice the special witness. An angel is carrying the eternal gospel. Before then, before, before here, only redeemed men carried the gospel. That is men and women carried the gospel. Witness for Christ. But now notice here, the angel is preaching to those who live on the earth the eternal gospel. What is eternal gospel? It's the gospel that brings eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, once saved, always saved. That's why it's called an eternal gospel. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 14, this gospel shall be preached to all nations and then the end will come. The gospel brings eternal life. God doesn't have to do a job. God doesn't save you and then take it back the moment you sin. No, no. Salvation is eternal. It's the good news that salvation is forever. I know there are many out there who are watching this program and been taught that you can lose your salvation. Where did you get that from? Put biblical passage. Put Bible verse that told you that. God's word is sure. A special witness and a saving word is an eternal gospel. And it's a sure word, too. Look at verse 8. And another angel. A second one followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Now, right beside that, put at the midpoint of the tribulation. That's when this is going to occur. 
Notice he repeats it, fall and fall. Why does he repeat it? Because he repeats it to let you know the repetition shows the certainty of his occurrence. Now, why is it going to be at the mid of uh, the tribulation period? Because we're going to see more about Babylon in chapter 17 and 18. Babylon is that religious, political, and social, philosophical system that's opposed to God. We're going to see later on that it's going to be a world church. It's going to start within the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Antichrist will, will be all for it until the middle of the week when Satan is kicked out of heaven and the Antichrist turns, he's going to destroy anything or try to destroy anything that's a rival to his power and prestige. And so God gives a sure word, Babylon's going to fall. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you know it or not, but all of this godless philosophy and godless teachings out here in the world today, and all this godliness, godlessness that's going on in the culture, one day it's going to be gone. Amen. God's going to set it right. But note this of your warning. Verse 9. And another angel, a third one, followed them. Notice they're coming right behind each other saying, with a loud voice, if anyone worship the beast and his image and receive the mark on his forehead and upon his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angel, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest. Day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, who receives the mark of his name. Notice, here's a warning. The fate of those who take the mark of the beast is sealed. Permanent. Cannot be reversed. If Christ comes back today, okay, now he's moving to the end of the seven year period. This, this, is, this, is, this is the end of the uh, seven year. Those who take the mark of the beast, all of them will be unbelievers. would have sealed their fate and nothing can be done about it. They're going to experience the wrath of God in full measure. What it means here, it will not be diluted. In other words, the wine that God's you ain't going to be Boone's Farm. Y'all remember the Boone's Farm? Yeah, I know some drinkers over there, from or drinkers in this church. Come on now. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No, God's not going to dilute it. God may delay his judgment, but he ain't going to dilute it. Dr. Robert Thomas says in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 20, it's the most horrible picture of eternal punishment in the book of Revelation. And notice it, and they will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Brimstone, write this down, is sulfur, which causes a whole lot of pain and agony. And notice, <clears throat> in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, you know that Jesus Christ is the warden of hell. So when a person goes to hell, they can't get out. So stop believing all those folks. I went to hell and came back. And it was terrible. And I was down there and I saw all them demons, yada, yada, yada. You know, you, you stop smoking that weed. Uh, 
you ain't go to hell and come back. Because Jesus said there's a great gulf fixed. That's what he said in Luke 16. There's a gulf fixed that one from hell can't cross over to heaven and one from heaven can't cross over to go to hell. So if you've been to hell and come back, you ain't been to hell. You was on a dream. Probably watching The Exorcist or Freddy Krueger. No. And notice what he says. And the smoke of that torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest. They, I thought y'all, people said, when I go to hell, I'm just going to go down and have a good time. I'm going to have a party. Now they say, ain't no rest day or night. No rest. Ain't going to be no good time in hell. If you don't know Christ and you die today, you're going to hell. There ain't going to be no rest in hell. That's the word we don't use in church no more because we want to be positive. We don't want to offend nobody. We don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Listen, you die without Jesus, you're going to hell. It's just simple as that. And God wants to warn you, you don't have to go that route. And those who receive the mark and receive the image of his name, they've, they've sold their soul to the devil. And notice, and here's the perseverance to the saints who keep the commandments of God and of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, yes, says the Spirit, they will have rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Notice the contrast. No rest for the beast worshipers, but rest for the Christ worshipers. You see, when you are saved, death doesn't damn you or doom you. Death only promotes you. Blessed are the dead who die where? In the Lord, not just in Maker. Not just where you live. Not because you know, he was in the church or she was in the church, she died. Oh, she was in the church. No, is he in the Lord? Because everybody in the church ain't in the Lord. I'm talking about from the pulpit to the pew. Because there are some preachers that are preaching that are not in the Lord. That is, they don't know Christ as their Savior. They've not trusted him as their Savior. He said, notice, they're going to rest from their labors. And lastly, as I hasten on, we're going to preview Armageddon's awful devastation. Now, we normally uh, 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 say the Battle of Armageddon. And, and by the way, uh, we'll see more of this in more detail when we get to chapter 16 of Armageddon. This is just a preview of common attractions. Okay? Now, note it. Now, Arma, this, this event, chapter, verses 14, all the way to 20, are going to occur at the end of this revelation. So it's going to anticipate Revelation 16 and 19, verse 11 and following. Jesus is going to be the judge. And the judge are the unbelievers. Those who are going to be judged are the unbelievers. And notice, and I looked and behold, a white cloud, and him that's sitting on the cloud was like the son of man. Now, why a cloud? Like we said before in Psalms, I believe it was 135 or somewhere in there, that uh, in that culture, uh, 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 they believe only the gods rule clouds. That's why Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, he stepped up on a cloud. The cloud became his platform because it spoke to the disciples as they watched them go away that only God ride clouds. And so Jesus coming back in a cloud. He said, let's sitting, one like the son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now I want you to turn to Matthew 24 for a second. Let's kind of piece a little bit of this together for you. 
Matthew 24, and write down verses 29 through 30. <clears throat> well, this is when uh, uh, this passage is going to take place, literally, uh, in reference uh, to the eschaton of the tribulation period. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. That's what he's talking about, this event here. We're going to see, uh, back, back to uh, Revelation 14, we're going to see that it should be referred to as a campaign of Armageddon or a war of Armageddon because it's a series of battles. And we're going to see there are going to be some nations that are going to get tired of Antichrist's rule. And they're going to seek to overthrow him and get that yoke off of him, off of them. And as they are fighting, then boom, the sky opens up. Darkness happens. Jesus is coming back out of the sky to the earth with his church, saints, and the holy angels. And his feet are going to stand upon the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is going to cleave. Make a valley according to Zechariah chapter 12. And the forces of Antichrist, who have been battling those who've been trying to put down, they're going to look and see that, and they're going to turn and join forces together to repel Jesus Christ. And they're not going to be successful. Because chapter 14 is going to tell you what's going to happen. Christ has a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, when you get to Revelation 19, he ain't got nothing in his hand. He just speak a word. His word is going to be like a sharp sickle. But you cut like, like a curve, a, 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 a sword, a spear, or whatever. You've seen when they cut down hay and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's curve, a blade. A sharp sickle in his Hand and a crown on his head. Another angel cried from the tip with a loud voice saying, put in your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. That's interesting because that word there in Greek is Zorano. Write down for that word ripe there, dry. <laughs> Dried up. Overripe. Rotten. He's talking about people. He's not talking about just grapes. The symbolism here is talking about people. Unbelievers. And notice, and he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another temple north is, 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 is in uh, northwest Palestine. going to come in wrath. He's going to judge this earth. He's coming back to take what is rightfully his, this world. Adam gave this world to Satan in the Garden of Eden. And Satan trying to defend what they think is trying to defend what they think is theirs. And they're gonna lose. And Christ's gonna set up his kingdom. For a thousand years on this earth. He's going to bind that old devil. Who's named Satan for a thousand years. He won't trouble, won't trouble anybody no more for a thousand years. According to Revelation chapter 20. But here. The nations of the world are going to be gathered against Jesus Christ. And against his forces. And guess who's going to win. Jesus is going to win. That's why you don't have to be afraid to stand up for Christ today. We're going to win. I watched uh, last night just a little bit of the uh, game between Miami Dolphins and the Las Vegas Raiders. The game was, a, uh, was the best of the whole game. It went back and forth, scoring. And uh, I 
And I said, well, you know, Miami going to, they needed to win in order to get into the playoffs. And, and so did the Raiders. And, and uh, man, it wasn't a minute left. And the Raiders scored. I said, well, it's over. And they kicked off. Miami received the ball and the quarterback threw a pass in the air when the guy had to pull his helmet, which is illegal, rather than a face mask, the helmet. And the guy caught the ball 30 yards down the field. But when he caught the ball 30 yards down the field, the referee called roughing the passer, which meant they tacked on 15 more yards to the 30. So it became a 45 yard pass. And the score was Las Vegas 24, Miami 22. Six seconds left in the game. And the guy had to kick a 45 yard field goal to pull it out. And Miami won. at all practical purposes that the Raiders are going to win. But Miami pulled it out in the last seconds of the game. But I want you to know in this game it ain't going to be tight at all. This game is already fixed. God has already told you who's going to win this game. Those that belong to him is going to win this game. And those who don't belong to him, they're going to lose. Even though sometimes it's looking like they're winning out there now, but in the end, they're going to lose and we win. So as I close this sermon this morning, for those who are watching, listen to me very carefully. If you don't know Christ, accept him now. Today is a day of salvation. If you're a Christian, hang in there, remain steadfast, remain loyal to Jesus in spite of what's coming back because Christ is coming back soon. He's coming back. And when he does, we will have fought the last battle. We will have shed our last tear. We will have felt our last pain. And God's going to transform our sorrow and the joy. Celebrate. Celebrate the win. Even though now it looks like we're losing. Celebrate the win. Be like the cheerleaders. Cheerleaders on the sideline, you can be behind 75 to zero, they're still cheering. They loyal. <laughs> a true story. I was uh, playing uh, varsity football at my high school alma mater. We played Central <laughs> at Old Porter Stadium. So you know how old I am now. And uh, they had uh, Matt Guess and David Taylor, two All Americans, uh, on the team at Central. And uh, <laughs> We uh, put up a good, good fight in the first quarter, but the second quarter it was it was over. Game was over pretty much, and we went in the locker room and the coach threw out our coat, threw out the Gatorade, <laughs> <laughs> threw out the salt tablets, everything. <laughs> well, <laughs> end of the game, Central Forty Eight. My alma mater, zero. I'm not even going to tell you my alma mater name. It's just zero. <laughs> but all the while, the score was that lopsided. The cheerleaders were still over there cheering. We're going to win. <laughs> no, we ain't. We done lost this game. We just can't wait to. For it to be over and go out to the farmer's market at the quail near and eat the buffet. That was it. 
but we're going to be on a winning team. We are. Much for those who are listening by way of internet and social media sites or whatever. Praise God for you. Thank you those of you here at the church who are presently here. Thank you for coming out and being with us. Thank you all of our members and friends who are giving to the, uh, continue to give as though you were physically present. You can go to the website and give on lithiabaptistchurch.org or you can mail it or bring it by the church and we'll be glad to receive that from you. And uh, be faithful in your giving, wherever church you go to, be faithful in your giving. God will bless you. He wants to bless your socks off. And this might be a test for you and for me during this time of present. And so do your best and uh, give to God. Thank you so much. Next Sunday we'll be in chapter 15. And, uh, and then the following week we'll start the bold judgments. I trust the revelation is opening up to you just a little bit. Right? You're seeing some of the things that are going to happen in the future. And uh, appreciate God for what he has done and what he is doing. God bless you and thank you so much. And may have a smile. Have a good week and have a, a blessed new year. God bless you.